now selected from the catalog of the world's most exciting hunting videos ever created. Briar Lakes Productions presents Ultimate Hunting for Alaskan Big Game, Volumes 1 and 2. It took years to gather the incredible footage for these two videos. Pursuing huge brown bears too close for comfort. Black bear, trophy moose, doll sheep, and caribou. For close encounters with the biggest and most dangerous animals on the continent. Order Volumes 1 and 2 of Ultimate Hunting for Alaskan Big Game today. Why do I hunt a Moultrie feeder? Since the beginning of time, man has sustained himself through hunting. Not only has hunting provided him the nutrients he needed to sustain his body, it has also provided him with the clothing, tools, and shelter he needed for his daily existence. Of equal importance were the lessons learned in teamwork and communication that became crucial elements in the success of the hunt and the ability to survive. As we face the new millennium, we can reflect upon the many changes that have taken place since the days of man's first hunt. It is true man no longer needs to have a successful hunt in order to put food on the table. Yet with modern man's hectic schedule and a lifestyle that seldom takes him outside the city limits, man's need to hunt may have never been greater than it is right now. Spending only a few days afield, away from the cities and the telephones, can cleanse the soul and rejuvenate the spirit. Having a close encounter with a buck such as this will elevate your heart rate, increase your breathing, cloud your thinking, and cause your face to flush with heat. This is a condition that man has known since the days of his very first hunt. Modern man has given a name to this condition. When you experience it, you will know it, and once you have had it, you will never forget it. This condition is known as buck fever. Join us now as we take you on a variety of hunts for North America's and possibly the world's greatest game animal, the white-tailed deer. But first, let's take a quick glimpse at some of the exciting hunts you're about to see. Let's join Jack Brittingham, Jimmy Houston, and Richie Bland as they relive the highlights of their past deer season. Whoa! Whoa. I saw him jump. I saw Whoa. him jump. That's a good one. You still using that worm, Alex? Yeah. You're a worm fishing girl. Don't let him pull you oh, in the lake. Oh, that's a big one. That is a good one. Keep cranking him. Keep cranking him. Oh. All right. Good to help hook him. job. Oh, that a girl. Way to go. Way to go, Alex. One of the things I've always said, Jack, and I believe it uh, with, with all my heart, is that, that kids learn a completely different set of moral and ethical values hunting and fishing. And there's nothing wrong with Little League baseball and basketball and, and all band, everything that, 
that kids do when they're growing up, but uh, but they they learn a special set of moral and ethical values. Not you know it's just and and it's above and beyond what they le can learn anywhere else. I'll tell you what I like about it, Jimmy, better than anything else. When you go out uh, hunting or fishing with your kids, you have a better opportunity to talk to your kids than any other any other activity you can do with them. You can go out to a soccer game or you can go to a movie. You can take them out to dinner. You can do a lot of things, but when you're doing those other things, you're not talking to each other. You're basically being entertained by some other activity. But when you're hunting together, unless there happens to be a big buck standing out there in front of you, you're talking and you're, you're, you're doing things that you would not normally get an opportunity to do when with When you're them. in a deer blind, when you're in a boat, when you're sitting on the bank fishing, you know, and, right. uh, and, and it's just a... It's just a, it's just a special, special deal, and uh, and it, it, it creates a lot uh, it creates a lot better kids, which in turn creates a lot better adults, and that's what we need. And it gives you an opportunity to talk to them about all the important things in nature, as far as conservation and habitat improvement, and uh, these are things that we have to pass on. There's no better way to do it than to than to be able to do it out here firsthand. There are things you cannot learn from a TV set. Uh, out here in the woods that you just can't teach unless you can do it firsthand. Fish? No, nope. misty. Well, when you see it happen, I mean, that's the deal. When you see things happen in nature, and, and you know, you've been all over the world hunting and, and fishing, and, and uh, every single day fishing, every single day hunting is an experience all to its own. Right. And it's unique, and, 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 you, and you don't have to have success even to make it unique and to make it a special day. No, you can see one little sight out in nature that makes the entire trip, and it, and it doesn't have to be related to harvesting an animal. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Alex. Uh, all yes, right, that girl. Alex. That a girl, all right. You know, Alex and I have had a lot of luck going out hunting uh, in the afternoons after she gets home from school. She'll gather up everything that she needs to do her homework in the blind, and we'll just go out and pick a spot. While she's doing her homework, we'll have a little deer hunt, and that's how she got her. <laughs> that's how she got her buck this last. That's uh, a great way year. to do homework too. Uh, I, yeah, I tell you what, I wish I'd had that option when I was yeah, a kid. Yeah, me too. Hey, what's 
By protecting this magnificent four-year-old from hunters until age six, it is a certainty that many of his offspring will be present in future generations. Not long after his departure, this unusual looking buck makes his appearance. Crosshairs right on his shoulder when you mm -hmm. shoot him. They were? Yeah. Let's go try to find him, okay? I'm ready. Yeah. yeah. Kind of hard to see in these leaves where he went. Right through here, Alex. What do I see up there? It's your first Briar Lakes Ranch buck. <laughs> Pretty neat, huh? Yeah. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. We came out here looking for a nine pointer and you ended up with an eleven pointer. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty good, huh? Yep. You carry your gun. Okay. You drag him out to the field here. And I don't. Don't drag him by this side. Whenever you said there's a deer we can shoot, yeah, I thought you were kidding. Because I, I looked over that way and I didn't see anything, and then I looked up here and I saw a buck and I was like, oh. There we go. Okay. Let's go, Alex. Let's go get the car. Okay. You think that was your favorite hunt? Yeah. Yeah, why? Because he didn't make us wait very long. He came out quick, didn't he? Mm-hmm. He made a perfect shot and he didn't go 50 yards. <laughs> a good hunt doesn't have to be a long hunt. Right? <laughs> no. You didn't even get the first chapter of your book read. I didn't even get the first, first word. That buck came out right before dark, maybe with about 30 minutes of light left, in the edge of the green field. And Alex made a perfect shot on it. The deer ran about 50 yards and piled up in there. You've never seen a little girl any happier was than she, she excited? was. excited? Oh, God, was she excited. <laughs> she, uh, she gets as excited about deer hunting as anyone I've ever seen. Only a few weeks later, as the December moon marked the beginning of the peak rut period in deep south Texas, Alex and her dad were once again sharing a deer blind. This time, they were hunting Rancho Encantado in the heart of the South Texas Trophy Triangle. Thank you. 
After looking him over, and with only one morning hunt left, Alex decides this is the buck she wants. Squeeze the trigger. Mm -hmm. Did you have any fevers? Mm -hmm. What kind of fever did you have? Duck fever. You did? What was it making you do? Shake and breathe hard. Were you shaking and breathing real hard? Did it make it hard to make a good shot? Mm, not really. When you're shooting, you're really concentrating on the deer not. Not concentrating on shaking and breathing hard. All right. <laughs> That's pretty cool, eh? A big nine. I haven't gotten any deer this trip, but I didn't think I was going to get any um, because I've only gotten a javelina and a coyote, and we're leaving tomorrow, and I only get tomorrow as a morning hunt, and so I didn't think I was going to get anything. That's great. You made another perfect shot. <laughs> One shot, Lou. Mm -hmm. Pretty neat. What a beautiful deer. Mm -hmm. That's a great deer. Let's take him back and show him to everybody. Special, isn't it? It's a lot of fun. What I tell it's you, it's all about. It brings a lot of pleasure in my deer hunting when I can go out and see that excitement in her. It's really better than, than you taking the deer yourself. It is. It uh, is. Uh, people can't understand that, perhaps, and uh, they, they, uh, until they, they actually experience it, they know really what it's all about. Well, but you know, it doesn't end with the kill. I mean, uh, we talk about it when we come back to the house three to four nights later and we pull a package of meat out of the, the freezer and, and thaw it out, and it's Alex's buck that yeah. she provided dinner for everyone. Yeah. I mean, that's a neat deal. Oh, yeah. Pretty special. And these kids go out by themselves. They'll come out here and go fishing and come back in, and they'll, they'll, uh, they'll bring what they caught, and we'll cook it up. I mean, you know, it's kind of neat for the kids to be able to provide, provide the evening meal. Yeah. Take your time. Aim real good. Good shot. Good shot. Don't move. He's about to fall. Did you have doe fever? Yeah, I had buck fever actually. You had buck fever? <laughs> Was it fun? Alex Brittingham took her first buck at age six. Shown here at age eight, she's already well on her way to becoming a seasoned whitetail hunter. What do you think of that guy? Good. With the enthusiasm she shows for hunting big whitetails, it's a safe bet you'll be seeing more of her on future buck fever videos. I was looking over to see if there were any deer, and I saw this big guy, and I go, I think, yeah, deer. He 
He's old, old, old. Way to go. What a great shot. You killed a, a really good one this last year, didn't you? Didn't you, didn't you get a good one in Illinois? Uh, we've had some real good luck this season on all the ranches. I had some excellent hunts myself, personally. Our season started off with me hunting with uh, a friend of mine, Brian Hawkins, who just took up bow hunting this last summer. And uh, Brian was a little skeptical about his abilities with a bow, but we uh, had a morning in November where we had excellent rattling success, called in three or four different bucks, we had one really nice four-year-old come right under the tree, and right. Brian made an excellent shot on it. Real pretty buck. I think it had 11 or 12 points. You let him shoot a four-year-old? Well. That's pretty, that's pretty iffy for you, isn't it? Not all of our four-year-olds are the kind of deer that I'm looking for on the <laughs> ranch, and, and we do have to take off about 20 bucks a year off of this property. So it was an ideal buck to yep. take out. And uh, I tell you what. On a guy's first bow kill, I'll be a little more lenient than I would normally be because that's an exciting thing. Brian Hawkins and Jack Brittingham team up in East Texas for Brian's first chance at a trophy whitetail with his bow. deer ever with a bow. That's great. I don't know what to say. I don't know what to think. You nailed it right there. God almighty. Three bucks come into the sounds of Jack's antlers. The largest buck is not seen until after Brian's shot. Whew, you stopped him in a perfect spot. Man, he stopped in the only spot we could have gotten. I didn't know if, if you were waiting to where you could see him or, or you you knew how I could see him. I mean, how did you know where I was looking? I just... Well, let's go take a look at it. I'm ready. All right, let's go. Here we go, Brian. Look at that. The blood clear up to here. Is that good or bad? That's great. That's great. God, that obviously broke off as it hit some brush or something and peeled off. The rest of it's got to be in him, so. He cannot be far. No. Uh, yeah, here we go. 
looking good. There he is. Holy. <laughs> oh. 200 yards, I betcha. That deer's dead. All right. Oh, man. I can't believe that yesterday is the first time I ever shot at a deer target. A deer target? Yeah, I'll tell you what, you picked <laughs> it up quick. Uh, that was a perfect shot. I mean, it, it couldn't have been any more well placed. This buck looks like a three-year-old, Brian. You can see his antlers uh, a little deformed here. I don't, I don't think that's a genetic thing. I think that's an injury. But basically, as a, you know, what you can tell from this side is that he's, he's not much more than a, a four-point. He's got a little G4 here but he's got really short main beams and I think his long range potential in terms of being a six or seven year old deer, I don't believe he'd ever break 160 points. So this is exactly the kind of buck we like to, like to take if we can when we don't feel like they're gonna, gonna make it into the real trophy class. But well, I'm heck happy of a with first it. deer. Yeah. Heck of a That's first neat. deer with a bow. Whew. You know, with the equipment we've got nowadays, it, people, they, 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 they see guys shoot bows and they've heard about bow shooting all their life. And it is so much easier to learn nowadays and a guy can become proficient really pretty easily. Yeah, it takes just a little bit of practice and some consistency and once he develops the consistency, uh, it's downhill from there. But interestingly, what you can do on a target, things change a little bit when you get one of those big deer in front of you. Brian was ex as excited as I've seen anybody and. He was able to hold it together long enough to harvest the deer, but after the shot, his face just said it all. I mean, he was so excited about that thing. That's the most fun part of it, is watching another hunter's excitement when he right. takes an exceptional really trophy is. like it that. It really is. Well, you had enough excitement over the next three or four days in Illinois to uh, take your mind off that deer, I'm sure. Well, we all did. That was, a, that was an awful good trip. It started off with a bang. Remember all that rattling action we had right there and the deer chasing around? When there were bucks just going everywhere over that right. hillside? Right. Yeah. That first morning that I had up there, I believe we had seven or eight bucks chasing the same hot doe. And I had that one buck that ended up coming literally right under my tree stand. I think that buck had the biggest bases on his antlers of any whitetail I've ever seen. As Jack readies himself for the shot, waiting for the big-based buck to present a better angle, he catches Jack's scent and bolts up the hill. That's an incredible action. We had bucks running around everywhere near chasing does. I don't think it's over yet, either. During the first morning of hunting at Briarwood Ranch in Illinois, the action seemed to be steadily increasing. You're probably wondering why Jack did not release an arrow at this incredible white tail. As you know, that ranch up there has a rule, a good management rule, that none of the better deer get taken before they're six years old so that they get the breeding out of them. I drew back on that buck, ready to shoot, but I did not get the signal from my guide. He says, nope, he's, he's not a taker. So I let down and watched him go up the hill, and he spent about an hour up there with a, uh, with a doe that he was, had kind of corralled up there, and we got to watch him. That was a really exciting morning. Well, I tell you, the, uh, 
The excitement didn't end for you that morning. I think that afternoon was even, even a little more exciting than the morning hunt. We went in and got a quick bite of lunch. It was obvious that the deer were in peak rut. And uh, we got back out there just as quickly as we could. We were gonna set up in a tree stand maybe about, oh, not more than 100 yards from where we were in the morning. And before we could get to the tree stand, we came into this wheat field and there were bucks running everywhere chasing this hot doe. And uh, we, so we didn't even get to our stand. We got out of the truck, ran down the road, and we were able to get down below this kind of bank. And as we came up over the bank, we were right in the middle of the action. There were bucks chasing around. There was fighting going on. This big typical five by five, about a 160 class deer, came over and bred a doe right there where we were watching, which is a very rare no, They sight. never ever smelled you or saw you or anything. Huh? No, the wind was wind in our right? favor and we had this, this weed bed in front of us. And uh, oh, it was great. Just over the top. I think I cut his back right, right across the very top. Shot him for 50 yards. He must have been 45 or maybe a little less. I'm not sure. Or I got excited and pulled it high. Did, did you shoot completely over, or did you touch the deer? You think you? you, you think I just you creased his back. Just skinny. Just creased his back. You could see. You could see the arrow actually skip. And, and take a take a, a flight path up after it contacted the deer, but didn't hurt him at all. He probably in thought fact, a bee. He probably thought a bee stung him. Exactly. <laughs> in fact, I think the next day Richie had a little encounter with that deer. The same deer. <laughs> same buck. That was a heck of a deal. It was cold. The wind was blowing. I'm sitting in the tree, and of course my mind's thinking about all these big deer everywhere, and I'd seen a few deer in the distance, and I pick up my binoculars and looking in a little patch of briars and grass about 150, 200 yards away, and I see something white, and I look back at it again, and I see a big drop tine yeah, hanging neat. off an antler on the left side. I know it's the same deer, and it's almost impossible to stalk a deer on the ground, especially a big white tail with a bow, but I, I got out of the tree, the wind was blowing perfect. The deer was, I guess, just sleeping. He was looking the other way. And I covered about 100 yards in this open green field, then got on my knees and crawled, and then got on my belly and crawled. And I got within 20 yards of this oh, deer. Man. He never knew I was there. The wind was blowing, and he finally stood up 20 yards, quartering away. It doesn't get any better than that. And I came up on my knees, and Jimmy, I, I drew I'm my- i just practicing jerky, I, don't I, 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 go I, drew, I drew my bow back, and I eased up, and the wind's blowing this grass, and I can see a little gap right there in the briars and the grass, and I'm gonna ease that air right through there, and I'm gonna go back to camp and show Jack his deer up close now. Uh, you know, I, <laughs> and I guess, that, I guess that gap wasn't quite as big as I thought it was, cause um, when I released the air, in fact, you can see a little, a little limb fall off one of these right. briars up there. I, oh, I, I hit a twig and that arrow went up across the top of his antlers and he was gone and I still don't know if he ever knew I was there. He's but. still laughing at both of us. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so in two days, in two days, y'all, I mean, and that, that deer is like, Jack, that's a nice fish. In two, and, and that deer, you know, that's like a 170 score deer probably, 180? Yeah, they're 170 at least. God, he was a gigantic deer. And he's still there though. Yeah. And he'll be bigger and better next year. <laughs> Another good fish for the lake. Yes, it is. And you know the thing about it? That deer's not even afraid of y'all. He don't think y'all could shoot. <laughs> <laughs> I would love another chance at him. I tell you what. That was a beautiful buck. It really was. You don't see a deer with a 10, 12-inch drop tine very often. 
a huge drop time. Yeah. But Jimmy sitting on that, that that stand that I got out of to try to go stalk that that deer. That same afternoon, I went back to the same stand, and I saw this big buck two or 300 yards down to my left, and went back and started talking to Jack, and we, we developed a strategy for this other big deer, and I'll let Jack tell this story because uh, Jack's hunt came to a fantastic conclusion, I tell you. He's bigger than the one that y'all uh, were practicing on. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, he was bigger than that starter buck, I tell you, this was, this was a heck of a deal. Jack and Richie's strategy involves locating two new tree stands on either side of the bean field, where Richie had watched the big buck chasing does that morning. These stands were put up during the lunch hour, leaving just enough time for their last afternoon of hunting at Briarwood Ranch. With ranch manager Chad John acting as Jack's cameraman, the hunters get set up for what proves to be one of their most exciting hunts ever. Looking north across the bean field, we can see the tree where Richie Bland and cameraman Mike Heyman enjoy a bird's eye view of Jack's hunt. As the non-typical finally makes his appearance, Mike Heyman captures this clear video from across the bean field. Only partially visible to Chad and Jack through the trees, they cannot identify this buck as the one they are hunting. As the big buck disappears back into the timber, Jack wonders if he'll ever see him again. But within minutes, the buck reappears and he's headed in Jack's direction. Because of the dense screening of trees along the buck's approach path, it is only now that Chad can get his camera into the hunt.
excellent. Man, was that exciting to watch or what? I was sitting right down here yesterday and we saw this big buck. Um, he's got three brow tines on one side, big old buck, a lot of mass to him. He was running those back and forth across this field yesterday. So we came in at lunch today and built two new stands, one on each side. And um, Jack's over on that side and I'm on this side. That buck came out, chased a few does around, went to one of the scrapes over there. Jack made a great shot. He came running right down the trail we were expecting him to use, just came running right by me. The shot looks good. That, that, I think the deer's gonna be right at the bottom of the hill right here below us. That was almost as much fun as shooting him myself. That was, that was great. Man, did you see that reaction when he got his, his feet came up? Looked like he was going to do a somersault. He was hurting him. That's him. That's <laughs> him, man. I knew it couldn't go far. Let's go. Man. Let's go. Look at this guy. Holy cow. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight on this side. So you got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine on this. God, and look at the <laughs> mass. I tell you, he was king of the hill last night. He was he was running those other three or four big mature bucks off. Really? Like there was a doe out there and he was he was he was the man. Well it looks like he's been doing some fighting. Some of these tines are chipped a little bit. He's got some big scars on his on his cape there. It's incredible. What a rush. I was shaking so bad after the shot in the tree that when I went to climb down, my knees were shaking. <laughs> Unbelievable. What a gorgeous deer. I was watching uh, the deer with the binoculars, and I was thinking he's got to be getting close enough for a shot. Um, I was in there and helped build that stand at lunch today, right. and I knew that was where a good shooting lane was. And, well, you uh, told me that, that every time you saw him, he just came and popped out there and looked around and he stood did. right there. But I, uh, I, was, I was thinking, okay, it's about time to shoot, so I took the binoculars and I looked at you, and about that time you released, I went back to the deer, and he's running straight at me. So I throw the binoculars oh, down, grab my bow, I come to full draw, and I don't know if he's hit or what the story right, is. Right, right, right. And he, he comes by at 41 yards. I'd already marked that trail. Yeah. And um, there wasn't any need for a, a shot, and I knew he wasn't stopping. He had, he had a big hole through him. Oh, so man. That is great. Well, we better get this guy out of here. It's starting to get dark. Wonderful. Congratulations. What a great deal. Thanks, guys. Thanks for the help. Thanks for putting those stands up. Excellent. I won't say that I was just as excited as if I had killed him, but that was a lot Pretty of fun exciting. to watch a good friend yeah. kill a gigantic buck Pretty like that. Pretty exciting. That was something. And for the, the strategy and the plan. Oh, yeah. You know, uh, you, you mentioned going out and putting a stand up in the middle of the day. That's something a lot of hunters won't go to the effort to do. But it's pretty critical, too, to kind of know where you are and where that deer might be, because if y'all had gone in there and the deer is close by bedded down, he's probably, you know, the noise of making, putting the stands up, he's probably not going to come back. So you got to kind of know your area well enough to know that the deer is far enough away. I'll tell you one of the big keys, one of the big keys to that situation is you get a hot doe living in a certain part of the ranch that buck comes there Nothing and he may there. be there for two days and that's it and then he's gone. But the key is you've got to react to what, to what that uh, buck is doing relative to that hot doe at that moment. And if you can get in there and take advantage of that opportunity, you can get, you can get a chance at a deer like that. Oh yeah, buddy. Come here, little guy. Come here, little pal. That's a good fish. He'll work. Yes, sir. I like it the way that, that lizard or plastic worm slides up that line. That just looks cool, you know? It Look at that slip sinker. That thing has been eat to pieces. Huh. You know, you talk about working hard to kill those, uh, kill those deer, Jack. The, uh, put that back there, Richie. Gotcha. 
That big deer that I, that I took in Illinois, right? biggest deer I've ever taken with a bow, we actually was hunting a big scrape. We found a scrape that was like this big in a creek bottom. And, uh, and we set up on the scrape, we did a drag line, we, uh, we, we had a, a, a bottle, a drip bottle sitting there on it. I mean, we did just about everything that you need to do. I had the stand set at like 27, 28 feet. And, uh, and we started hunting and we, and we actually just hunted. That's a good lizard. <laughs> <laughs> no wonder they like that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and and we uh, we started hunting. We just hunted all day. I mean, we just sat up there before daylight and stayed in the, in the in the stand all day. And we saw several bucks. We saw does, and, and we saw really, we saw really uh, two other good shooters. We saw one nice eight point that was probably 140, 145 score. You know, a big big deer for an eight point. That's a nice. Really big deer for an eight point. And uh, and we uh, we saw a ten point that was. Probably a 155, 160. I mean, both either deer I'd have taken with, without a doubt. Both of these deer came around, and and I rattled at both of them, and, and just you know they didn't really pay a whole lot of attention. The 10 point came around the, like the third day we was there. We hunted all day Monday, all day Tuesday, all day Wednesday, and that 10 point came around that that early that morning. When I rattled the horn, the deer looked up and took off running like he'd been shot. And you know, and I thought right then, I thought you know, I can't believe I scared that deer with the horns. And I just the thought crossed through my mind. I wonder if there's some bad boy in there that's whipped him that right. he heard those oranges and he just didn't want any part of that action. And uh, so hunted all day, saw another little deer or two, and it got late in the evening, I mean really late. And we've been there three days hunting all day, daylight till dark, for three solid days. And it's big scrape, and the scrape was fresh, been worked at night. I mean, you come in, it'd been worked, and so you think, well, sometime during the day he's got to check it. Right close to dark, looked up on the hill and there was a little fence up there, and we was hunting close to a property line. We couldn't go across the fence, right. couldn't shoot across the fence. And uh, so I saw, you know, some big horns coming through the woods there. Missed him, Rich. <laughs> well, he hit it reeling in. And, uh, and I just looked up there, and all I could see was horns. I first thought it was a 10-point, but now I just saw horns, you know. And this deer's got a double brow tine, so it, it just, it, oh. you see like five on each side sticking up, you know, not just, not just big wide horns. And, and uh, and the deer stayed, and, and I rattled, and when I rattled in, boy, he looked down there, and I knew that, well, this is the deer that had made that, you know, made the scrape that we hunted for three days. He just hadn't showed up. And the reason that those other deer wasn't coming to the scrape, obviously, is because, you know, it wasn't their scrape, and right. they didn't want any part of it. And that deer fooled around, and he fought a bush, and he jumped over the, missed him again, missed him. He? That's a little, uh, you got any crappy in here? <laughs> and and uh, <laughs> he, uh, he jumped that fence, and, and when he hit the drag line, he came in just like he was on a string, just like you could wind him in. And it was so dark that, uh, that you, you couldn't hardly see him. In fact, you know, as you come down, you know, we'd, you'd almost lose him. It was getting so late in the evening. I was concerned about seeing my pins. That's I didn't have any lights. That's when you see those big ones moving around. Oh, yeah. Right that, yeah he, but if he had waited five minutes, 10 minutes before he came out, we wouldn't have had an opportunity. But the, the, the great thing is when he come down and, and the scrape was here, and I was on a tree like this big around. I didn't know if he was going to come to the left or the right of it. And I was really confused about where to set up to shoot. Right. And uh, so I actually took I actually took my bow and put the arrow right straight up like this, where I could move to one side of the tree or the other. He came to the right side, but it was getting so late that when he and he, and he actually came and just stopped perfect at about 18 yards. And when I drew on the deer and looked through my peep, all I could see was brown. I really didn't know exactly where I was. You got him, don't you? Got him. You bet. But I couldn't see exactly where where I was. And so I raised up to look to make sure because I, I didn't know if I was too far forward, too far backward, or what. And when I did, he started walking. Really? And I nearly died. I mean, I just nearly died. And there was about four or five trees, and he walks just past those trees. He had stopped perfectly. He walked past the trees that I couldn't shoot through, and I just followed him. And I, I was looking up, you know, I wasn't looking through my peep, and when he stopped the second time, he again stopped perfectly. Like, you know, if you don't want to hear, I'll just move right here and take, I mean, that's just what it was like. And, uh, and then when he stopped in, well, I knew, and I looked through my peep and shot, and it was perfect. And he runs up on the hill, but the, the funny thing when he ran up on that hill is he, he ran up there, and, and, and I couldn't really tell. I mean, I heard the air hit, and, but I couldn't tell where the hit was. It's just so dark. I mean, it just got, it just got really late. And uh, he ran up there about 60 or 70 yards and was standing there. And I didn't know. I thought, well, I think it's a good hit, but I don't know. If he had been there 10 minutes earlier, we'd had nice, pretty bright video of him, but he came right at dark. In fact, it was so late 
that when I first pulled down on him and looked through and got on my peep side on my pen, all I could see was brown behind it. Didn't know where I was on the deer. And I raised up and he took two or three steps. I come down the second time and then I could see right where I was and, and the shot was exactly perfect. I'm telling you, when you got a really big deer working a scrape, uh, I just think that they're not gonna, had a boy. I just think they're not gonna come to that scrape. See, we're out here in a little bit deeper water. See, see, we're getting out here some of the females. It's a good fish. Yeah, we're getting out here and some, some of these females are just hanging out in this deeper water. Oh yeah, yeah. that is a nice bass right there. That I is a I'm nice a fish. I thought I was hearing a little thunder back there. I heard a little thunder. I didn't see any thunder, but I heard yeah. some thunder. Yeah. That is a nice bass. It sure is. Oh, yeah. How would you like to have a nice home, lady? You've got one. I think we're going to put her in a better one. She thought she was pretty good shape already for as far as the house, didn't she? Yeah, that's She'll like big. this other place better, yeah, I think. Yes, she will. <laughs> big old brown eyes. Woo! Yeah. Jack, what about rattling? You rattle a lot, and I, I like to rattle, but so many times I don't have much success at it. Um, wh when's the best time to rattle? Well, you know, each property that, that we hunt has a little different time. Obviously, the, the best time to rattle is right before the peak of the rut. Here on this ranch, that occurs somewhere between, I'd say, about the 10th of November to about Thanksgiving.
this year. We called in eight different bucks from this location over a course of about maybe 30 minutes worth of rattling. The two biggest bucks were uh, both four-year-olds. One of them would score about 170, perfect five by five. And the bigger deer actually had almost all of his right main beam, everything in front of his G2 busted off. That deer, without being busted, would have gone close to 190. He had about a 10 inch brow tine on one side with two kickers coming off of it. And then he had about a seven inch brow tine on the other. His G2s are 14 to 15 inches. He's just a monster deer. Then we had a couple of really nice two year olds and a couple of really nice yearlings come in. We had a couple of smaller uh, three year old deer that were kind of management bucks that came in. But there's so much activity in here, there must be a hot doe somewhere. That was incredible. Oh, where's the fish? We had some of our best luck this year around Thanksgiving because the weather never got cool enough down here till about then. Oh, that's a nice fish. But, uh, little rascal. Around Thanksgiving, I had a friend of mine from uh, Illinois down, Brad Sievers, and we hunted together for about four days. And in four days' time, we probably rattled in 10 or 15 Fat different bucks. That that's great. She is beautiful, I'm telling you. With Brad, there was a, a hot doe in the area and it was good action all day long. But we ended up changing locations for the afternoon hunt. We moved about 300 yards. We waited until right before dark and we rattled in three bucks. The third buck that came in was a six-year-old buck, six or seven-year-old buck, real mature deer. Had three brow tines on one side, really good mass, and he made a nice shot. And uh, that, that's how we got that buck to come in was by rattling. All right, Brad, this stand we're going to go to is in a great location. South of it is an alfalfa field. North of it is hardwoods. It's a great transition area for these deer to move in. We've seen a lot of good bucks in this area, a lot of good deer. What we're hoping for is maybe we catch one coming through. Great. Nice overcast day. Good day to sit. Hopefully we'll have some luck. Well, this looks like a good area. It's a great area. It's a great spot. You can tell the funnel that goes straight down. Here's our alfalfa field, hardwoods up here. Let's just get set this on and go. 
Hunter Brad Seavers and guide Stephen Zisheng join forces for an East Texas whitetail hunt at Friar Lakes Ranch. Man, those are really nice deer. How old do you think that uh, second buck was? He looked like a three-year-old Brad. He looked like a three-year-old, but a real nice buck. Gosh, those deer really responded to the horns. That was incredible. Oh, right now, right now, it's pretty much key time for the rut. The deer responded to the horns real well. How'd you sleep last night? Oh, not very good. A little sleepless. I think it was a good decision for us to wait till the, the morning. But I hope the rain didn't mess us up at all. Let's we'll just see what we can't find. Well, it was about right out in here. There's a spot right there. Yeah, there it is. There it is. Oh, but the, the rain last night up there was washed clean. It's not a good sign, not a good sign. Let's get it out of here. Let's start looking.
Oh, man. Hey, Steven. Here he is. God, he looks great. Steven, here he is, man. Oh, man. Here he is. Look at this. God. Nice buck. Well, it worked out. Look at that. Took a little while. Took a little while, but you know it was a it was a good idea to wait. You know, last night it was. It was a great idea. It worked out. Well, thanks. That was a great hunt. I really Congratulations it. on a great deer. Nice buck. <laughs> this is a great deer to take. Boy, that was a great hunt last night. That doe came down. I thought, well, it's just a doe, but pretty soon this guy started to show up, and uh, you gave me the green light on him. Boy, it's a Great deer. How many points has he got? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. We have fourteen points. Fourteen points. Fourteen scoreable points. God dang. You know yeah. how lucky we are to find this buck. Oh, just how long were we at it before we got on it? Oh, I, we must have been walking them grids, you know, about forty-five minutes to an hour, yeah. you know, but just steadily walking them grids, staying apart, staying quite apart, boy. It's right nice. Out. That's an awesome deer. <laughs> awesome deer. Jack, during some of my late season bow hunting in Georgia this year, I saw a bunch of gobblers together. The aggravating thing about Georgia is you can't turkey hunt during the fall. Uh, in Texas, do they have a fall turkey season? Or? Oh, sure. In Texas, you can hunt fall or spring. In fact, um, our spring season will be starting here in about another three or four weeks. You got one, Jimmy? <laughs> hey, come on. Uh, I'm heading down to a ranch on the Texas coast called the Kennedy Ranch to do some turkey hunting. It's probably some of the best turkey hunting in the state. Uh, You've been yeah. down there, haven't you? I've hunted the Kennedy Ranch for deer and turkey both, but let me tell you, they have got so many turkeys, you just cannot believe it. And I, they got a lot of big deer down there. And uh, my buddy Mike Morales that, that, is, that runs that place down there. I know there, Mike. He is a deer hunting dude, and let me tell you, he'll- Did you ever see the buck he killed about uh, 10 years ago, which was the, at the time, the uh, non-typical state bow hunting I record? I sure have. I, I sure have seen that buck. That I've, is heard, a... I've heard that story. That is a beautiful story? deer. Yeah, oh yeah, I, he hunted that deer. Oh, there we go. He hunted that deer, I think, for about three or four weeks before he finally got the perfect opportunity and, and got a chance to arrow him. Having set up his ground blind the previous day, Mike Morales settles in to hunt one of the biggest bucks he's ever seen in the South Texas Coastal Plains region.
shot was about, oh, about 22 yards. He came out of that point, he was kind of nervous, came around, was checking out the situation. We had to be still as a rock, and then he came on in to get into that brush, and I, uh, I need some air. When he got behind that cactus, it was perfect. I drew back, and he stepped out and stopped. I couldn't believe it. And I put that pin low on the shoulder like I like I like it. And that arrow flew right where I wanted it. And he ran about, he went a good ways, about 150 yards, more than I expected. But uh, I'm gonna recuperate here for a while. I'm still shaking. Man, what a buck, what a buck. <sighs> Man. He looks even better on the ground. Seventeen points. You know, Mike's not only a good deer hunter, he is an excellent archer. I mean, he's one of the best guys with, a, a, with a bow in his hand yep. that I've ever seen. He made the best shot on that deer. I mean, you couldn't ask for it to be any better. And the deer, I think, covered about 100 yards, and he had his trophy. It was just a fabulous animal. That's thousands and thousands of acres of, of open territory. There you go. I believe that ranch is around 400,000 acres. It's, uh, I know it's at least 200,000. I know it's really big. Yeah, well, there were. I believe the rain's getting close. What do you think? Come here, buddy. That's a nice fish. Oh, yeah. Female. You know, we're talking about that big buck there from South Texas from the Kennedy Ranch. Um, get Jack to tell you about that big buck he was chasing in South Texas last year. At the Kennedy or at your place? No, it was down at my place. It was a bit of a heartbreaker of a story. You know, I've been fortunate enough to have pretty good luck if I've gotten a buck in front of me that I wanted to shoot, I've been able to get him. But it didn't turn out that way on this one. On the morning of his seventh day of hunting, from the same palm-covered ground blind, Jack prepares for another long day in his quest for one of the biggest bucks he's ever hunted. After having been in the blind for less than 15 minutes, the monster buck that Jack has waited so patiently for is suddenly there. But as quickly as he appeared, he vanishes. Within 10 minutes, and still in low light conditions, 
the buck makes his second appearance. As with airplane crashes, it is not one mistake, but a combination of errors that contribute to this unfortunate outcome. As Jack begins his draw, the absolute stillness of the morning allows the buck to hear Jack's carbon arrow as it slides along the arrow rest. Now on full alert, this savvy six-year-old buck has focused his attention on the blind. Jack tries to recover his advantage by allowing enough time to pass for the big buck to settle down. Knowing the buck may hear him, Jack comes quickly to full draw. The combination of Jack's not covering the prongs on his arrow rest with mold skin and his inability to see his sight pin in the low light conditions within the blind, coupled with almost uncontrollable excitement, caused Jack to make a poor decision by releasing an arrow after the prime opportunity had passed. I tell you, I put in so much time for that guy and he was probably one of the more desirable bucks I've ever had an opportunity at. And I just blew it. You know, I, I wasn't properly prepared because I didn't have the right pin set up and it was that dark in the blind. Uh, but I mean, he's about 24 inches wide, 11, 12, 13 inch G2 and three points. Uh. And uh, uh, great mass, just a gorgeous South Texas buck. And then I think the next week, Richie and I were hunting down there. We went to that same spot and Richie killed a really nice wide buck. There we go. Got him? Yep. Well, that's a pretty one. Yeah. 
Jack and Richie make the decision to stay in the blind and see if Richie can fill his second deer tag. And it wasn't long before they were treated to one of nature's most rare sights. As is typically the case, it is not the size of the antlers, but the body size of the buck that usually determines the winners in these battles. Although this four-year-old's rack is clearly superior to his adversaries, he was not the victor on this day. These bucks fought on the left side of the blind, and this buck, it was almost like as if there was an imaginary line right, right on the left side of the blind. He never would cross it. I was filming him. And he came to within 10 yards of the blind. And, and he still he couldn't get a shot? Right, but he did one of the most incredible things right there in front of us. It's called a snort wheeze. I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but it's this, this sound that they make when they're trying to intimidate other deer. And people make calls for it, and they, they, you can buy them at Walmart. But very few people have ever seen a buck do this, and they make a, an incredible facial expression when they do it. It's not a grunt. It's, it's a different not a deal than a grunt. grunt, and I won't even attempt to, to recreate it out here in the boat because <laughs> I don't know on. how I'd go about Come it. Come on, I know your grunt's pretty good, so how about your snort weave? But uh, anyway, this guy gave us two two big snort wheezes right there almost in our face, and, and uh, maybe he knew we were in that blind, Richie, because he would never step out there. Briar Lakes Productions and Jack Brittingham would like to thank you for joining us for Buck Fever 2, Volume 1. If you haven't already done so, we invite you to pick up a copy of the second volume in this series. Here is a preview of some of the exciting hunts you will see.
Volume 2 features Jack's hunt for the largest wild whitetail ever taken on video. His incredible Texas State non-typical record buck grossed 249 Boone and Crockett points. And don't forget to pick up a copy of our other feature presentations. Quest for Mongolian Argales, 30 years of hunting for the world's largest rams. Briarwood Whitetails, pure whitetail bow hunting action at its finest, plus great whitetail management tips. And Buck Fever, whitetail hunting from the Midwest to South Texas. The average score of the 10 bucks taken on this incredible video exceeds 170 points. And for the waterfowler, ultimate hunting for Canadian honkers, noted as one of the finest waterfowl videos ever produced.